What have you learned about yourself in your journey? Therapy, I would say, really helped me become the therapist I am today. And then over over the years, I saw how many people used art and how it saved them. I think we all hear about famous artists and their mental illness and seeing how art really taps into the body. And for me, that's kind of where I see the pain is. It's not in our mindset, it's in our body. Have you ever faced any resistance from people who question the methodology? The older generation laugh at the idea of a person needing therapy. Yeah. Back in my day, I didn't need therapy, which is, yeah. that's actually laughable. We're all coping. So you're going to cope. Whether you like it or not, it's just a matter of choosing how to cope healthier versus not so healthy. Honestly, like a panic attack is one of the scariest physical experiences anybody can have because as you said it, it literally feels like you're about to die. Yeah, the only thing worse than that is actually death. There should be a mental health and wellness class in school from grade one. 100%. Right. I back that up. Yeah. And I'm not even going to ask the question I ask every guest. What, what subject do you think should be taught in school? That's what should be taught. Episode 96 of the Mo Show podcast. I think I told you earlier that it's been 72 days since I recorded episode 95. So forgive any rustiness that might come your way. Luckily, I'm in the presence of a therapist who uh, I can go to if I have any problems. Uh, episode 96. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We have Ms. Rawan Bajser. Uh, she's a Saudi art therapist, visual artist, and author. Rawan holds a BA in art therapy from Lesley University in my favorite city, Boston, Massachusetts, and a master's degree in art therapy from NYU. Lesley's in Boston, right? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, yeah. yeah, Cambridge. Specifically Cambridge. Cambridge, yes. yeah, thank you. <laughs> in 2020, Rawan wrote her first book in art therapy practices for resilient youth and... Book chapter. Book chapter. Yes. And book chapter. If uh, I need both those links in the show notes so that people can access them. Yeah. There's a way for us. Absolutely, okay. yeah. Uh, Rowan comes with 10 years of experience working with children, adolescents, adults, and their families with a variety of mental health challenges and disorders. I love uh, starting with open-ended questions, and there's one that I'm starting to exercise, um, which is the following. Rowan, why is it that you do what you do? It's a really good question. Deep one. Huh? Yeah. I mean, for me, I do it because that's how my experience has been in understanding and making sense of the world around me. So ever since I was like, I think two years old, I started scribbling on my parents' like walls and the bedroom walls and all of that. So that was my way of finding out about the world, exploring about the world. And then later on, it just kind of took off as a way of... Um, becoming an artist. So my parents put me in oil painting classes every summer and it just grew from there. And from my personal experience, I saw how art and maybe specifically like the process of making art and creativity really um, was kind of my, my glasses for the world. Like it was the way I would understand everything. And I saw kind of the, the, I guess, positive return on my mental health and how that helped me. And then over over the years, I saw how many people used art and how it saved them. I think we all hear about famous artists and their mental illness and seeing how art really taps into the body. And for me, that's kind of where I see the pain is. It's not in our mindset, it's in our body. So that's, that's why I use art. So... Is the, is the process of creating something, is that kind of what gives you the endorphins or dopamine or, or whatever kind of uh, sensation the body gets in order to feel good? Uh, is, is it the creation process of art that, that helps you heal, that helps you recover, that helps you feel good? Absolutely. I, I think it's always process over product. So I always think that there is so much value in the process of creativity and the process of making it from selecting the materials that you want to use to um, finally producing something. But I do, as much as there is value on the art product, I think the art product is always the part that terrifies most people and usually why people don't want to make art. 
Um, so for me, it, it is the process and it's very organic. So the, there's a lot of um, activation of the different parts of your brain, like decision making, problem solving, like if you, you know, missed something, you can always cover it. But with that creativity and the creative thinking of it, you utilize and it's a mind body connection. So essentially, you're using both. So many people who are listening would have no idea what on earth art therapy is. And, and you, you are explaining a little bit, but, but if you can just go into a deeper dive on what it is to, uh, you know, a five-year-old, how would you explain it? Yeah. I mean, if I get a, if I get a riyad for every time I get asked this question, I'd be a millionaire by now. Which is what, what is art therapy? You're asking yes. a lot. Yeah. What is it? Um, or what is it exactly? Like, how does it work? Um, so I always say there's so many different definitions, but my definition of it is, first of all, it's a mental health profession. So it's not something that you um, just kind of learn as you go in life and, or learn just because you're an artist. It's something that you have to get trained. So it's a master's entry mental health profession, and it's a form of psychotherapy. So essentially it's a modality um, that where you use the creative process and the product to help people um, heal or process something or explore something that's going on or has happened in the past. Have you ever faced any resistance from people who question the methodology uh, or maybe ignorant to, to, one or to, to what it is and how do you respond to those people? Oh yeah, a lot. Um, I think, I mean, with art therapy, it's not that it's very new. It's been around for over 50 years, and I think we can all have our own experiences of seeing how art is is used as a way of communication. Before language was there, there was art. You know, back in the caves, they would draw something to communicate. So that's how it all started. But the resistance I face is more so as um, their thinking is very limited about how you use art and art therapy specifically is only for people who know how to make art or have an experience or are skilled in art, um, at the use of art, I mean. So that's mainly what I, what I see. So um, I also see the resistance when it comes to the research that backs up art therapy. I mean, art is very subjective. So it's very hard to quantify the effect of art on your mental health. So it's only recently that there's a lot of research happening about this where we have to collaborate with like neuroscientists so we can do like brain imaging before and after an art therapy session and see what lights up and what happens before. So because it's so subjective, subjective we have to use um, specific measures to really um, see the effect of it. So I think it's just, we're behind on a lot of research, but the bright side is there's so much room to write and create literature about this. What's interesting is when you touched on how before we were able to verbally communicate, I'm thinking now Stone Age, Caveman era, they most likely did use drawing methods to communicate with one another. Yeah. Um, uh, b yeah, before dialogue or words or conversations ever were a thing. Absolutely. That's telling. Yeah. And I always say art never lies, like never. No matter what story you tell yourself, what story you've um, learned to know about who you are and what happened to you, art tells you something otherwise. And so I always use art is there not to be beautiful. It's there to help you see something new. It, it helps you learn something new about yourself and what you experience. What did you mean by never lies? It's accurate. So it's an accurate reflection of what's internalized in the body. Isn't it, isn't it open to interpretation? Like what someone might think is a beautiful art piece, like if we're looking at you know one of the classics, yeah. Like someone might say, you know, what's so special about the Mona Lisa? I'm not saying that. <laughs> but someone could be like, it's a lady who's, you know, kind of smiling and, and that's it. And then someone would be like, are you crazy? This is the most beautiful picture that's ever been painted. Yeah. Kind of like a subjective. Mm -hmm. So when you said art never lies as in as in it's it's there on paper, it's factual. It's I'm just trying to understand what you meant by that. Yeah. 
I mean, it never lies in a sense if as you, the creator of it, it tells something about you. So versus the viewer, you know, where you look at it, you're going to have different interpretations. That's why as an art therapist, I never analyze art for people. I never say, oh, the, you drew this line zigzaggy. That means that you've had an aggressive childhood or whatever. Like, I would never say that because that's my interpretation and that's my projective identification of it. Um, so when I say it's never lies, it's never lies telling a part of who you are. And that part might be conscious or unconscious to you. Uh, so, so the, the, so, okay, so this is how it works. I'm a patient. I come to you and, mm -hmm. and you're going to practice the art of art therapy on me. And you would say something to me like, Mohammed, please draw a picture of your childhood. So when I'm done with that masterpiece, <laughs> what you see on paper in terms of interpretation, that does not lie. Yes. Because you have communicated to me, you have communicated that to me in, in ways that were used even before we were able to speak to one another. Absolutely. So that's what you meant by that. Yes. yes. Got there. Yes. Got there. I got it. I got it. <laughs> that is deep, by the way. That's, yeah. that's telling. Yes. Uh, and I would do it in a way that's kind of like more of a dialogue. So I would ask questions to the person who created the art as a way to guide them into understanding like the symbolic meaning, the metaphors or whatever is there. Um, so it's always kind of being curious about about it and it's there as a third element in the room. So there's the art therapist, the client, and then the, there's the art. Um, so I wouldn't say I would interpret means like I would tell them what it is, but help them understand the meaning behind it and how it relates to why they're, they're there to, for therapy. Are you of the belief that I can get more out of a patient through drawing than words? Oh yeah. hundred million percent. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'll tell you something now, if I ask you to remember any memory from your life, or even to simply like imagine a black cat mo, what would you say? Would you see a picture of that memory or a black cat? Or is it that a word pops in your mind? No, obviously, yeah, the, the, the image. image. Yeah, so most people think that way, whether you make art or you don't, whether you consider yourself a visual person or you don't, we all store everything in a visual form. So I always say it goes through multiple processes for you to uh, translate it into words so I can explain it to you versus art is just there as it is. Um, so that's how we all remember things and that's how we pick up everything in the world that we live in. What's a typical client look like? Like what's the most common client that comes to you? Is there a, a common uh issue that they come to you for um if you're allowed to speak about yeah um i think if we're talking about saudi here in jeddah i would say there is a huge number of people who have experienced traumatic events or have endured some sort of trauma in their life so that's been actually like the focus of my work um trauma mainly and then I think an example I was talking about like a, a death earlier on in their lives or watching their parents fight what kind of trauma so a trauma is what happens inside of you Dr. Matei I think yes uh, Gabor Matei yeah um, so so he says that so trauma is what happens inside of your body um, so trauma is not the event it's not what happened to you it's what happened inside of you based on because the of what happened because of what exactly so there is a billion of things that can can be uh, traumatizing for somebody it can be an adverse experience it can be a big one we call it big t trauma versus a small t trauma small t it's not necessarily small but it's small in a sense that it happens to almost everybody it's part of life versus a big T trauma, it's more of like a singular event in a person's life and it's out of the blue that happened to you. And it just, it's something like, you know, um, sexual abuse, uh, rape, um, war victims. So it's a single PTSD. PTSD. PTSD can come from both. 
is is trauma in one way or another PTSD? Are they like embedded yeah. in yeah post traumatic, traumatic stress, stress disorder? disorder. Yeah. Yeah. And there is CPTSD, which is complex post traumatic disorder. That basically, to put it simply, it means that there's multiple traumas that the person is has endured. And if such experiences aren't dealt with, what can you expect to happen to that person later on? I think it just hardens. It hardens in so many different manifestations, whether that becomes a maladaptive coping mechanism, whether it it can be substance use um, issue, it can be um, relationship issues, and it can be physical illnesses. So you see that a lot when it comes to trauma. A lot of it becomes a psychosomatic physical experience for a person. And now there's doing a lot, they're doing a lot of research on how cancer is related to trauma and a lot of, yeah, and a lot of heart diseases. So yeah, if you don't deal with it, it will shape your life. عجينة محضرة بشغف قوامها خفيف وهش وطعمها ولا أروع And when you work with a patient, the likelihood of them being free of that or reversing it, mm-hmm. how close to 100% is it roughly? 80%, I 80% would say. 80% they recover. Yes. So really good odds. Yeah. It, I mean, because a lot of the, the older generation laugh at the idea of a person needing therapy. Yeah. Back in my day, I didn't need therapy, which is, yeah. that's actually laughable. Yeah. And look at me. I got hit and nothing happened to me. You know what I mean? Um, so that's what I hear a lot. But honestly, like the body is so resilient. People are so resilient and we all cope. I think that's the part that sometimes we forget. We're all coping. So you're going to cope whether you like it or not. It's just a matter of choosing how to cope healthier versus not so healthy. Um, so, yeah. There's also an era discrepancy between the generation that our parents lived in and the interconnected world of the era that we currently live in. Yeah. If something was to happen in a city two continents away, we'd get notifications on almost 10 different apps telling us that this thing happened in that country. Yeah. So exposure is at an all-time high. You can see the whole world in your phone. Yeah. And so kids nowadays are exposed to way more than you and I were, or our parents even. And so because the exposure is getting higher, it means that they are actually developing faster than what we've all even studied or even trained for. These, you know, um, developmental stages that we have, childhood broken into early, middle, and late, and then adolescence, and then you see youth. Now, a lot of research is actually pushing it further, like in, in shifting it in different ways to match the the day the age that we're living in mm-hmm. now. Yeah. Someone once told me, and there was a bit of truth to what they were saying. They said that if COVID hadn't happened in the '60s, it would not have been anything more than just a flu that we wouldn't have heard about. Absolutely. But it was uh, sensationalized across so many different, yeah. and and it became um, as mainstream as mainstream gets. Yeah, I think that's, to me, one of the best parts of COVID is it really highlighted the mental health issues that are there and the importance of doing that. I think more so here in Saudi because we're such a culture built on like socialization and we're so community oriented um, culture. So everybody missed their friends and everybody like just did not know what to do it with themselves. Struggle. Yeah. So I think that was a big time for a Saudi to take a look at themselves and see what are the areas that they want to work on. And that's when you see like, boom, like it just blew. Cause I came to Saudi from the U S 2019 and six months later, COVID hit. So for me, I saw that 
because before I come to Saudi, everybody's like, oh, nobody's, you know, there's not a lot of demand on therapy. And it's just, it's waitlist, over waitlist, over waitlist. And it opened doors for people because, you know, we're in a culture where we're taught, like, keep your home secrets, like, on low key, like, ju just don't talk about family with anybody. So it opened the doors for people who could not tell their parents that they're going to therapy. They're going to ask, oh, where are you going every week? So now they can do it from the comfort of their own bedroom. Through Zoom. So you're saying that, uh, or any of the other uh, communication apps, <laughs> uh, was it a matter of a lo the loneliness or, or not knowing what the future holds? What, what was bringing people through? I think it's just spiked. So whoever was cruising by, who was, whoever was, you know, just make, surviving, let's yeah. say, um, the pandemic came and it just heightened everything that was already there and probably even more so brought, you know, um, something from under the surface up and it became very clear for people who had, you know, anxiety is so normalized and it's so common that most people think of it as a characteristic trait. Um, so when the uncertainty of the pandemic happening and we didn't know when we we're going to go out and how life is going to look like, anxiety just started building up, building up at a, to a point where it really got in the way of their daily functioning. Because that's what most people, what brings most people to therapy. If something is not working, like if they can't go to their job, if they cannot socialize, that's when they're going to be like, oh, we're in a crisis. Let's go get help. And I think... The pandemic just pushed people over the edge to pursue therapy. And it also normalized it because a lot of people were struggling at the time. So everybody was using social media to talk about their struggle and try to just find a way to cope with the current situation. So it was um, talked a lot about and people started verbalizing what was going on with them. And, and then virtual life started. I think having that option and now there's a lot of, you know, online therapy apps and, uh, you know, accessibility has always been a big problem yeah. in therapy, not only in Saudi, everywhere. Had to be face to face, right? Yeah. Imagine you're like in the deepest, like struggle and you're going to go find who is going to be your therapist. Like Figure. that's a lot of work. So many barriers to to eventually have that conversation yeah and now for sure with with these with these apps i mean it's just so much easier where are you not just helping people in the city that you live in yeah. but you know potentially clients all over the world yeah absolutely 100 percent. and and it was also the loneliness that you mentioned so i think because the pandemic was so huge it took over everything else like nobody saw anything else but covid at the time and now that, you know, we're over it, um, kind of, I guess, not really, um, there, it, it highlighted that there is actually a loneliness epidemic we're living through right now. I can pull up the statistics if you want, but I think it was like 43% or something of Saudis report that they're lonely. So here you're talking about a loneliness epidemic. And globally. So Glo globally, I know. Yes. Globally, I know. There's... But here too. Okay. It's actually Saudi has one of the highest statistics. Like when you look at the percentages compared to other countries, there's a lot of that. Despite families being so so close and always seeing each other, and there is always this, you know, tendency to just get together. Yeah. D despite that, there is a loneliness. Yeah. Problem. Yeah, because loneliness is different than aloneness. Okay. A lot of people think, oh, you're so lonely because you don't have a lot of friends to go out with. It's not. It's about connection and connection. It, and sp more specifically, genuine connection. So if I'm sitting here with you and I don't feel connected, it doesn't matter if you're with me every single hour of the day. Um, anxieties. It sucks. I, I had my, my fair share of stumbling upon it and not knowing what on earth it was in, until I was experiencing it. How does that come to sensation? Like, how does the journey of anxiety, where does it start until it gets to the point where you physically feel it in your body? 
I mean, I always remind people anxiety is an emotion before it was ever a disorder, right? So it turns into a disorder or it turns into, let's say, an issue if it disrupts your daily functioning. So meaning sleep, eating, social life, work life, studying, these are the areas. So anxiety is there to protect you all the time. Like its job is to protect you. So I would say it kind of, it, it becomes a problem when it becomes overprotective of you, when the fire alarm system, aka anxiety, becomes so sensitive. So if you put bahur, it will like turn on. Oh. That's when you know something is off because it, you're now become, became hyper alert, hyper vigilant, and therefore hypersensitive. And then back to our point about exposure, we're exposed to a lot of different things. So we're constantly picking up um, on a lot of information. There's a lot, of, like a slew of information coming your way at all times. If you're just scrolling on your phone, there's a, a million things. And yeah. to the human like, body, that's just a threat. Say it, say it a hell of a lot of. Yeah. I read a study recently and it says if you stare at your phone without blinking for way too long, your body is going to be tricked into thinking that you're under threat because you're as if you're, you're caught, caught at the like um, in front of a bear or something. So you're going to, you know, your body is going to start producing all these cortisol hormones yeah. and all of that and adrenaline too. And then it's just going to go in survival mode. Panic attacks are the worst. Yeah. yeah it's so had a couple. Yeah. The issue with having them is not knowing what it is. Mm -hmm. And if we were educated on on I mean the sensations of anxieties and panic attacks, when you get it, you won't feel like you're actually gonna die. Yes. Because like, ah, oh, so this is what we were told about in biology class or whatever class. There should be a mental health and wellness class Absolutely. in school from grade one. 100%. Right. I back that up. Yeah. And I'm not even going to ask the question I ask every guest, what, what subject do you think should be taught in school? That's what should be taught in That's, school. That's, yeah. And life skills, I think, you know, like just which which mental health mental health can be a part of that too. Yeah. Um, and being able to read an income statement and a balance sheet. Exactly. <laughs> because Absolutely. because you only learn that if you study accounting. Yes. You know, but like, yeah some basics but but really like mental health and and wellness is something yeah. that should be integrated into elementary school Absolutely. you grow up believing and 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 being exposed to how to take care of of this from a young young age yeah. and then by middle school it just becomes second nature absolutely it's psychoeducation to to me that's like the most important type of ed education and I'll be biased because I'm a therapist I'll, I'll think that um, but honestly like a panic attack is one of the scariest physical experiences anybody can have because as you said it it literally feels like you're about to die yeah the only thing worse than that is actually death exactly and so you can imagine the survival instinct that's going to kick in when you experience that and how how much more difficult it would be to de-escalate and regulate back to, you know, an, um, uh, let's say a relaxed state of mind. Um, if you knew the symptoms, like there's so many people that come to me for anxiety and I would say like eight out of 10 people would say that they went to a heart doctor before they came and saw me because they thought that there was a problem in their heart. And, you know, hoping that the doctor is actually, like, um, educated on mental health, they're going to tell them, oh, you should go see a therapist yeah. instead of give them... Or just take some beta blockers, right. which is probably what 9 out of 10 of them do. Yes. Because I saw a heart doctor, and he gave me beta blockers. Yeah. But it wasn't a physical or any problems with my arch. Exactly. It was just being overstressed. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's funny, what I realized, is that going through that made me more resilient made me stronger I don't know what it is it's yeah. like battle stripes you know when you go to war after that nothing much will scare you 
Absolutely. Not that I've been to war, but I, you know, I've seen enough movies to imagine, wow, these people went through that. They go back to the real world. What scares them? Nothing. Yeah. So going through what I thought was near death uh, and experiencing it made me a stronger person. My life is still just as stressful. Mm -hmm. But alhamdulillah, I no longer feel anxieties and panic. I wonder, if is there a, a pattern with if you go through it once and you conquer it? You know, I'm still just as stressed. I, I still don't meditate as much as I should. I, uh, you know, I don't gym as much as I should. I um, haven't maybe dealt with some overhanging problems that I should have as much as I should. I'm still living the same stressful life that I was when I was going through that. But I don't get it anymore. Is there any reading into that? Absolutely. Because resilience is your ability to bounce back. And once you've bounced back, you have the confidence of, I've seen this, I've done it before, been here, done that. So there is confidence in yourself. Like when you, whenever you feel that, now you know the early warning signs of a panic attack. You know when it's coming. You know what um, triggers it, basically. And you know how to deal with it. So you've kind of found a way or a system for yourself to know how to cope with it. So maybe you have not reduced the elements that create more of it, but you are able to manage it and regulate it. And once you do that, there is no better confidence than believing in yourself. I can get through this. Yeah. It doesn't kill you. Makes you resilient, I would say. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We mentioned Gabor Mate. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correct. Yeah. Um, I actually quoted him here and I wanted to run a sentence that he said by you. Financial stress on parents translates into physiological stress on the kids. Can you elaborate on to what he meant by that? Yeah. He's one of my favorite people. He's so good. And he's so real, I think. I think there's very few doctors who do not pathologize everything. And when it comes to mental health, people jump immediately to, I need a label for this. I need a diagnosis because, right. yeah, most times it's because it validates their experience. It's like, oh yeah, I, I struggle with that. But it doesn't do you much, you know, the diagnosis or the label. But, but back to what he said, financial stress is considered one of the adverse experiences a child can go through. So thinking whether it's poverty or a little bit, you know, more of a stress, it's going to make the parents be on survival mode all the time. And when they're on survival mode, I think we can assume what's going to happen to the child because the whole environment is going to be based on that. The way their interactions with the child is going to be like that. So the child is then going to also be on survival mode. So mix those together, the survival mode of the house plus the adverse experiences, you got a child who probably has a trauma. And I mean, when you say financial stress on a child, uh, I've never even attempted to process how a child would have to think about financial stress. And when you say a child, I think four, five, six years old. What I understood from that is financial stress on on the parents and and how they cope with that difficulty or complexity in their lives yeah. in taking out their frustration of the world onto their kids. Absolutely. You think like is it is it a two way street where 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 children are also affected by financial uh, constraints that they see their parents going through? Yeah, because. To me, I, I always think of the home environment as like a micro version of the macro world the child is going to grow up in. So essentially, like when they're when the parent is going through any difficulty, whether it's uh, um, illness, um, financial stress, or their own traumas that they haven't dealt with, that impacts the child directly because for in a child's life, the most important important, most influential part 
is home life. And then you got the school because eight hours of the day goes there too. Um, But that's how they learn, you know. So when when the parents are stressed out financially, they might go out to work more. Therefore, it might be some neglect happening, you know. Uh, maybe not neglect in physical uh, matters like food and a house or a roof over their head, but it can be emotional neglect, and that can be as damaging as not having a house to live in. Well, I'm not breaking the cycle of trauma that you went through and thus projecting it onto your children mm-hmm. is probably one of the the, the biggest disasters of the world, not breaking that cycle. If you were abused, for example, as a father, yeah. not breaking that cycle and then and then taking out your frustration on your child and thus abusing them uh, mentally is, is, is really something that I think needs to be taken with a lot more seriousness. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I always say too that going to therapy is probably the best gift you'll ever give your children like doing your own work. Maybe it, it's not in therapy, whatever. Like it doesn't have to be in therapy. Maybe you do it in your own reading, your own um, in having insight and having an understanding of what childhood that you had and reflect on it. That's, you know, basic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for those tuning in on the Instagram live, I didn't tell you about that, sorry. <laughs> so rude of me. Um, we're with uh, Ms. Rawan Bajser. She is a Saudi art therapist. Uh, this episode will air in a week, inshallah. <clears throat> the reason for the Instagram Live is I wanted to see if anybody had any questions that they'd like to throw her away. And um, and I'm sure she'd be happy to, to answer them. So if there's anything, put it in the chat box and we, <clears throat> excuse me, we will uh, send it her way. All right. Until then, I wanted to ask you about um, if you could advise parents uh, on on one specific thing from all the sessions that you've done over the past four years and, and maybe through your training as well, if you can give some advice to parents, maybe new to the game of parenting, uh, on how to deal with maybe a difficult child uh, or a child in need of therapy in some capacity, what would uh, a common advice come from you? Mm-hmm. It's a good one. I would say be curious and stay curious because everything that you need to know about your child will be in them already. So if you just pay attention before you judge the situation, before you solve the situation, just be curious and ask your kid questions. Oh, why did you do this? How does that work? Teach me this, play with them. That's gonna solve, I would say 80% of the issues. So interaction. Interaction and being curious instead of disciplinarian or um, educating them. Just be a kid with them, play with them, be curious about their things. And that goes for teenagers too, not just kids, all ages. It's all about interaction, right? Inclusion. Yeah, uh, making them feel of value, absolutely, and not neglected. We have a question that came in from um, something Mutaib. Uh What does she recommend someone who has been doing online learning for four years and hasn't, in and and as a result of doing online teaching for four years, hasn't been a social? So trying to get back on their on their social feet. How how would yeah. you advise? I would. Um, advise, I mean, four years is a long time for a child. So there's probably some areas of their development that was hindered or delayed or um, something probably happened there. So I would say first thing is consult with somebody because it really is specific to your case. But if we're giving a general answer, I would say start gradually um, helping them build connections. So start with having play dates, like one-on-one play dates, socializing with them, bringing, you know, some family members, cousins or so, and then slowly build them to a bigger group of people. Right. Gradually, gradually sure. build your way back up. Yeah. 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 That's, that's actually, because of COVID, I mean, I never thought of that. 
there, there, there are kids out there probably still doing online courses. Yeah. And unable to in- integrate themselves back into a regular classroom. That's absolutely. Yeah. I just can imagine that the fear of them not wanting to go back into the the physical world of classrooms. Yeah, I mean. Okay. Yeah, and and it became their norm. Like four years in a child's life, that's a lot of that's time. A lot, long time. It's probably like yeah. half of their life. Exactly. So I would say that and also put a limit on their devices, their screen time. Absolutely. First thing. We'll take one more. Uh, what signs do you, is a great question. What signs do you look for in a child to see whether they need therapy or not? All basics of daily functioning. So uh, if there's a problem in their appetite, if there's a problem in their sleeping, so they're oversleeping, undersleeping, having a difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep. Um, I would say their academic performance, their social life. So seeing if they're having friends or or not. And when we say friends, he doesn't have to be the most popular boy or girl. Uh, So... um, just looking at if there's any um, abnormalities in these areas and then take it from there. So if there's any issue in these areas, then immediately consult with a therapist. All right, guys, we will uh, let the Instagram live people go now. Uh, in a week when we publish this, we'll have links for anyone who'd like to reach out to uh, Ms. Rawan uh, if they're looking for therapy for themselves or for their children. We'll make sure to link everything in the show notes. Thank you guys for watching on the Instagram Live. We're going to get back to the episode now. Something I wanted to say earlier, and really one of the things, but we covered it, we covered it, but still, I just, I need to mention that one of the things that really bothers me is the people who feel that they don't need psychoeducation in some capacity. I am good. I don't need it. And I think those are the people that ultimately need it most. Absolutely agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I think when you think, remove the cycle part, just the education, like nobody ever runs out from things that they need to learn. Like life would be so boring. So psychoeducation means learning about yourself. Yet, Like we're ever evolving. You're learning every day and things are happening to you every day. So what you knew last week might not apply this week. So it took it's a constant process. It's never ending and it's ever growing, I would say. Yeah, yeah really. It's a work in progress, yeah. Yeah. Heard that a lot. <clears throat> That's like art. Always a work in progress. Always a work in progress. There's sure. a famous question in art, like, when is the artwork ever done? Yeah. And and is is it is it like understood that it's never done? It's always a... Yeah, until you say it's done. So it's all in in like in the hands of the artist. What have you learned about yourself in your journey? Therapy was the best thing I ever did for myself. Have you helped yourself from your learnings? Yeah. Yeah. Therapy, I would say, really helped me become the therapist I am today. Because when you work with people, um, you're bringing in your whole self. So empathy requires... For me to understand your sadness, I need to connect to my sadness. And if I don't know where my sadness is and what it is, I'm just, just going to project everything on you. And that's when I'm going to really harm you. So for me, therapy really helped me learn. It helped me understand how it feels to be on the other side. I still do it. I've been in therapy for nine years now, consecutively. And you don't see yourself going anywhere else or doing any any other uh taking on any other job or another industry it's it's this that you want to be doing yeah it's my calling it's your calling yeah does it feel like work some days i'm not gonna lie some patients yeah i mean it's a lot of hard work like i only see five people a day that's it that's it i don't do more than that I've tried, I've done, you know, as a, you know, I was, when I was still beginning in my career, I wanted to prove everything and gain all the experience and all all of that. So I used to do way more, like seeing seven, eight people a day. Five is still a lot. Five is a lot. Five is the max, five honestly. Five different stories, five different problems, five different solutions, or maybe even more than five different solutions. Yeah. But that's a, a lot of weight to deal with on a daily. Yeah. Yeah. 
And for me, the way I, I found art therapy wasn't a very straightforward line. So for me, I always knew I was going to be in a creative field and never in my life ever thought of wanting to be a therapist. Like it didn't even cross my mind. And um, I actually started out studying fine arts and design. And in my first year, I remember telling my advisor, hey, I really like psychology. Can I do all my electives in it? And so she looked at me and she's like, oh, you're interested in art and psychology? Do you know that we have an expressive arts program, like arts therapy, I mean, program? And I don't know how she was placed as my advisor because she was a dance therapist. So I was like, I don't know what, what that is. It was the first time I ever hear about it. So she advised me to take a class and try it out. And the minute I took it, I was like, that's it. Like I've always been curious about people um, and art has always been my comfort zone. Like it's where I feel the most competent too. So this was a mix of the two things I love. It's a perfect storm for you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very organic too. You know, a lot of people feel like they don't want to go to therapy because they're just talking about the same thing and they're like a broken record. So when you look at art and you make the art, you see the art that you've done on day one versus day 100, you see your progress. So on a bad day, you know what I do to clients? Bring out their portfolio and be like, see where you've gone and like where you are, I mean, and where you, you've you been. And that's proof. It's proof. Proof is in the pudding, as they say. Yeah. When you see the, the chronological growth. Yeah. And they made it. Mm. Like, I think creating something and being part of that process of change um, registers on a deeper level. And back to trauma, Trauma is never healed in the head. Like you have to heal it in your body. Every time your body reacts to something, gets triggered by something, the way you regulate it, that's your healing. Exercise. Yeah. It's uh, it's the ultimate. Medicine. Yeah, absolutely. Or any movement-based, body-based activity. So when you're making art, you're essentially having some sort of movement. You know, look at people when they listen to music, there's an immediate effect. Like if you put a sad song, everybody's going to get sad. Dopamine trigger. Mm -hmm. Second you hear anything, for sure. Yeah. You reminded me of a few horror movies that I've seen where the teacher goes to the parent and says, I need to show you something that your child has drawn. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like a horror movie junkie. <laughs> so I'd see a picture of um, the child, the dog, the sibling, and then one of the parents with like maybe, sorry, but like a gun to his head and then blood. Yeah. Uh, you know, just let's go with this example for a second. And, and that's art. Yeah. He couldn't express it. Kid's three years old. Mm -hmm. He couldn't express himself the way he wanted to. But my God, he made people exactly know where he was coming from with the pain, with the drawing. The Absolutely. Expressive. Yeah. Yeah. Very. So that's what I remind people like, you know, kids don't care about how the picture is going to look like. They just care because about doing it because that's kind of their way of what I was saying before, making sense of the world and communicating. So when you look at uh, kids art, of course, it's going to tell you a lot. But never assume, always ask the kid, what's happening in your picture? Tell me, what is the rabbit doing here? So, and that's how you're going to understand. You never say, oh, there's a gun. Maybe it wasn't a gun. Maybe it just was a remote control. You know what I mean? So never, never assume, because again, subjective art. Yeah. And this horror movie was a gun. <laughs> I'm sure it was. What's something that needs to be said that no one's talking about? Leave it open-ended for you. Hmm. I mean, I think, I'm gonna have to think about this one, but yeah. I think for me, um, the buzzwords, you know, um, that we hear a lot on social media, like attachment, trauma, relationship issues, toxic, toxic. toxic. 
every other everything. Season. Yeah. Um, part of me is really happy that people are talking about mental health, but the other part is just like, oh no, like you're misunderstanding a lot of the stuff. So I think like always fact check who you're getting your information from. You know, there is a big difference, for example, between, and I'm going to say it, life coaching and psychotherapy. They're not the same. And, you know, I think most of us want to have somebody who's like by our side. We can call any minute. You can't really do that with a therapist. You're going to meet with them once a week. And you're going to have some boundaries with them. They're not going to be there whenever any crisis would happen in your life. Um, and so I think the desirability and the, um, like how people are really attracted to life coaching is because one, it's practical. You see like the end of the tunnel with it. Um, and it's more, I would say, like organized in a way, like these are our goals. But life is way more organic than that. So I think life is um, a mix of a lot of different things that there should no, their, their role is not there to tell you what you should be doing or cheer you on because that's going to still steer you to a certain direction and that might not be the best for the person. So back to what I think people should talk more about is um, like being educated on the things that they're learning and not really following anybody on social media who is not trained or licensed or educated as a mental health professional. So that means not a course in Dubai, not a six month retreat, none of that, that does not substitute therapy. It can be adjacent to what you do. Life coaching can be adjacent, but it cannot be a replacement. And it really, it's a topic that really is close to my heart. Does the profession of a life coach bother you? Yeah, I would say, because, you know, there is there is the stigma of therapy, not just in the Middle East. I think it's everywhere, but more so here because our na the nature of our culture. So it upsets me because the minute people started hearing of life coaching, they would go to that instead of this long-standing profession with a lot of research to back it up. Just because it's cool, just because it's short shorter term than therapy just because they are promised with a result at the end. And to be honest, most people don't really get out of it. Most like they don't get out of it what they actually want because they still hit a block. So it's always like a band-aid to whatever is happening in your life. It it uh, it took off as a a profession in the last decade yeah and it does have this cool element to it way cooler than uh yeah i'm gonna go speak to my therapist yeah i actually have a life coach yeah i wonder the psychology behind that yeah i mean i think about that a lot and i have my own like i guess opinions about it um i think human beings don't like uncertainty with therapy, there is a lot of uncertainty and there is, sure, there is guidance, but there is nobody telling you the answer. And people always want and push for others to tell them what they should be doing, but they don't like it the minute they hear it. So, so when you go to a life coach, it's just somebody who is like nicely organizing your life and this is what you're going to do and these are the steps you're going to take and this is going to be like your treat at the end, your reward. And most people do that and even if they succeeded in doing that, it's because they probably have done the foundational work to that. 
Like, it does not work the other way around. It's not life coach and then therapy. You know what I mean? And then there's a bunch of people who are not ethical. So they would make, you know, they, they would advise people on uh, mental health related subjects. And they're not, you know, qualified to do so. So whether it's breath work, whether it's sound therapy, whether it's life coaching, all of these are great, but they're not the same as psychotherapy. I think psychotherapy will tell you something that you don't want to hear. Yeah. And a life coach is just going to give you a pat on the back and make you feel like you won the day. Yeah. But not and real, real, you know, digging deep to find out the, the root of the problem. Yeah. And most people like to stay on the surface because it's comfortable. Yeah. And therapy does not stay on the surface. Nothing that comes from comfort. Yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. No growth. Yeah. Uh, well, I just learned something that therapists and life coaches don't see eye to eye. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about this at lunch every Wednesday. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, something important that we haven't spoken about yet. Is there, is there a question that I'm going to ask you? Did we miss anything? I think there was one that you mentioned about mistakes, common mistakes that parents do. I missed that one. You're right. Yeah. And then there was another. What's one. the most common mistake that parents make? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, what is the most common mistake that parents make? Um... You know what my mistake with with my six year old is that I I baby him too much, I protect him from everything, and that's a problem. Um, it oh. was Gabor again, Gabor Mate. He said that uh, when there's a baby, well, when he would be in a position where a baby of his is crying, he would let the baby cry it out because the world is not going to give you a hug when you are entering it. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna have to figure it out on your own. Yeah. So protecting, it, it's, you know, it's definitely an unconventional method by today's standards. But when you hug and comfort the baby, you can expect that in his growing up years. Yeah. And the world will not hug you when you need a hug. The world's gonna kick your ass when you need a hug. Absolutely. So I've, I've had mine kicked. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it was an interesting angle that, that uh, he came from. Yeah. And, and and to your point, what I would say like the most common mistake for parents to do is letting their guilt decide for them how they're going to be with their kid. So to your point, like overprotecting is because there's probably the feeling of like, I don't want to be guilty if like he, you know, he goes through this experience and I didn't protect protect him from it. So I think sometimes the guilt gets in the way of um, healthy parenting uh, gets in the way of the child's own method of understanding the world and learning how to self-soothe. Yeah, self-soothe. Is that the the end game that you'd wish for any child to have? Yeah, is to know how to make yourself feel comfortable under moments of like stress. So regulation is the most important emotional skill any child can learn. And when you don't learn that because your parent is at every opportunity jumping to calm you down, and then you're never going to learn. And you're going to think this is what others should do for me. And that's when you get dependency problems, whether it's on substances, codependencies and relationships and so so on. So I think regulation, to me, is way, way more important than any other emotional skill. So tough love, kind of. Where do you stand on, on tough love and whether it should be practiced? I mean, the word, for me, that phrase is a little bit conflicting for me because tough and love are just two opposite things. Awesome. Love is, yeah, love is more soft and nurturing versus tough is more kick you. Um, so I would say just not, you know, there's always going to be love. 
like even when you're uh, correcting a child's behavior, even when you're teaching them anything, you can do it from a loving place. Like you can be gentle and firm. You don't have to be mean and aggressive for them to get it. So always, you know, you might say the same exact thing to them, but if you say it with like with a firm tone and a gentle like approach, then they're going to pick up on that. I had Asya Khashukshi on way back in episode six, three years ago. I think it was six. And, um, and I asked her, like, have you ever seen a, a reverse in a child before and after? She said, yeah, this one comes to mind. I'm like, can you tell me what, what, what solution did you suggest for, for the reverse to happen? And she said, I told the parents, remove the iPad from the child for a couple of months and they saw a 180 degree change in the behavior of the child. Yeah. They were shocked that it was the screen that was creating the complexity in, in the child. Absolutely. Isn't that, that's just, that really just baffled me. Yeah. So we now with, with our child, it's one hour a day on the iPad, that's it. And even that we're like, should we bring it down? One yeah. Yeah, I mean, one hour, I would say it's good because you're also raising a kid who is going to have to, you know, use screens all the time. So you cannot really, like, forbid them at all. But you need to instill in them this compass that they're going to know how how and when. I mean, it depends on the age of the child. So if they're really young, young you have to regulate that for them. But they're going to learn from your system. You know, they're going to learn that you're definitely should not look at a screen before you sleep. Um, blue light. And now they offer like these sunglasses or glasses that, that protect your eyes from the blue light that you should be wearing three hours before you. I haven't tried them, but but yeah, I know the dangers of blue light and how it keeps you up mm -hmm. for God knows how long. Uh, yeah. So you see, there's all these like adaptations for us to continue staying on survival mode, actually. So the blue light is not going to do because, okay, sure, your eyes are going to be protected, but what about your brain? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's constantly like responding to all these informational cues you're getting. Yeah. So, and it's, you know, while we're at this topic, I, I want to say something is we're also living in an age where kids are like highly um, um, inaccurately diagnosed with ADHD. So how, how does it explain that to me? So ADHD looks a lot like anxiety in kids. So it's kids hyperactive. Exactly. And so when you get a kid who is overly stimulated by the screen, um, then he's going to become um, a dysregulated. They're going to become um, maybe aggressive or moving too much. And then the school is going to be upset and the school is going to call the parents. Your kid is cannot sit still in class, he is not learning. So they go take him to a psychiatrist or a doctor and they immediately diagnose him with ADHD because guess what? When you do the assessment for ADHD and you have anxiety, you're mostly gonna score yes for ADHD. But when when like the reality is that you actually have an anxiety and you have anxiety because there's a trauma behind it. So they skip that and they go for the shortest answer to make sure that the kid is just thriving in school and not looking at the root cause of why this kid cannot sit still. So they grow up with this label and then, you know, it can be ADHD and it can be other things like ODD, which is Oppositional Defiant Disorder. Never heard of that. Yeah. So kids who are like, no, I'm not going to do that. That's oppositional, basically. So a kid who's not listening to the teacher will also be diagnosed with that. So you, we see this, I see it every day at the clinic. I see it every single day with kids and unfortunately grown-ups too. Like rebellious. Mm -hmm. So it's like it became a trend like, oh, everybody has anxiety, everybody has ADHD. And you stop there. That's, I think, the most harmful part of it is you stop there as if that was the solution. That's it. All you needed is somebody to tell you, you have ADHD, take some pills, and you're going to be good. So you you got over-medicated kids, 
and definitely a ton of unprocessed traumas, which will pop up later in life. So they're going to, you know, cruise by in their school years. And then later on, they're going to start to see all these issues pop up in their relationships. And that's where substance abuse comes in. Because <laughs> it kind of, their brain started, um, it didn't start. I mean, their brain got used to something else, external pill that regulates their brain. Help those who are abusing drugs. They need help, not punishment. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. And I hope to see more therapists who are specialized in that because it does require a very specific training to manage, um, you know, cases that have substance use or substance abuse, I would say. Yeah. They changed the, the term for it. And now it's called, we don't use addiction a lot because it has, it's very highly stigmatized. So uh, in the DSM, which is the diagnostic uh, my manual that we use for diagnosing people, it's substance use disorder. Substance use disorder, way better than, uh, than the first one. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes just like simple terminology can, can go a long way. Yeah, the power of reframing. Well, thanks a lot for, for coming on and sharing uh, you know your 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 stories in the chat in the in the field of uh, psychotherapy. My pleasure. Um, again, uh, these are really some of my favorite episodes because we can learn a lot from it, and I learned a lot from it, and I'm going to learn more from it when I watch the episode. So thank you, and uh, really, I hope you enjoyed. It. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. It was very natural, and I really enjoyed the conversation. Amazing, fantastic. All right. Um, well, I hope uh, everyone who watched enjoyed it. Let us know in the comment section what you guys think of it. And um, and that's a wrap for episode 96. Thanks so much, Rowan. Thank you. Okay.